Well, hey, everybody. My name is Scott, and this is Nathan. Hey, hey. And we are continuing to do our podcasts on what we think are some outstanding books that we would love for you to pick up. The current one we're doing is Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. And this is an excellent resource. And we did section five last time, and we're about to start part two. Do I have that right? Part yeah. two? Yes, part two. Yeah, it's, it's um, a little wonky with the, the, it's not chapters, it's like parts and sections. Yes, a little, it's not, it's non-traditional. Is that a saying, non-traditional? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So she starts out part two by saying, daring leaders who live into their values are never silent about hard things. Mm -hmm. And that is challenging just to read uh, because sometimes I am silent about hard things. And Mm -hmm. so I found a lot of challenge, but also encouragement to press into my values. It's really, this whole section is really asking the question, A, do you know what your values are? Can you narrow say a list of 15 down to two Mm -hmm. and she's pretty adamant about like two primary values that you live by because that's what the research has showed and i and i want to express i mean she makes a hard line between talking about values that you maybe admire versus the ones that you really do live out so yes distinction and she has a long list of values mm-hmm. in this section. And as you read through the, this long list, you want to kind of allow that, if I may, that bottom right part of your brain, that just that to feel, like as you read these words, to really feel what these words mean to you. And as Nathan just said, I think that's so important is this something I think I should underline? Mm-hmm. For example, this, let me pick one like self-respect or serenity. Yeah. If we're in recovery, serenity would be one that we we think, oh, we should raise our hands for that. Or is it one that so resonates with me yeah. that I absolutely have to say this is one of my top values? Yeah, she literally says we don't shift our values based on context. We're called to live in a way that is aligned with what we hold most important, regardless of setting or situation. So, you know, context or situation might be we're saying the serenity prayer, but that doesn't mean that that necessarily changes an innermost value that we each carry. Um, yep. But she does give a lot of practicals in this chapter. Um and of course, the first one is being able, I think she literally lists, what do you, what do you think? How many are there? Like a hundred values here? Oh, um, I, yes. Um, yes. Because her, her first step is we can't live into values that we can't name. So if you don't know your values, you might just be bounced around by, by the cultural values or um, other people telling you what their values are. So that's right. I think, I think that's why she listed so many so we can start to name them so yes and and to give some more context she says that when we jump into the arena where we're starting to be brave to be vulnerable to be curious the the thing that is going to keep us moving forward will be our values she says in those moments where we start putting other voices in front of our own we forget but what made us get into the arena in mm-hmm. the first place, the reason we're there, we forget our values. And so I wrote down this question. I'm thinking, of, at least for myself, my life as a pastor, like this has been a this has been a difficult week for me in, in many ways. And I wrote this question in light of what she said. Why did I start this journey in the first place? Mm-hmm. Like not the journey of this week, but the journey of of my particular vocation, at least for me, and maybe you can ask the same question. Why did you start this journey in the first place? Of the things that matter to you most, 
remember that moment that you said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to marry this person. I'm going to pursue this occupation. I'm going to become a follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, you think of some of the biggest decisions that a person could make and go back to that moment. Why did you start this journey in the first place? Mm -hmm. And those values will motivate you um, during times that can be somewhat chaotic, unsettling, and cause fear. It is also what carries you, I think, too. You know, during times that are unsettling, you, you know, we'll often keep doing what's most instinctual. Um, and she's saying that's why values play an important role because they determine, <coughs> excuse me, they determine behavior for sure. So. Absolutely. And so um, I encourage you again to pick up this chapter, take a look <laughs> at the list of values and try and narrow it down to two. And then ask yourself, if these two resonate with me the most, am I actually living by them? That that stat, if I didn't say it yet, that stat about only 10% of people follow their values, that's that's very convicting for me. Yeah. Not uh, not that yeah. I think others aren't. I'm wondering, well, maybe I'm one of the 90% who gets excited about talking about values but don't really live them out. Yeah. And she makes it super practical. I like on, on one of these pages, 193, you know, because she's often asked for, as for business or asked by businesses to come in and help them, you know, straighten out what their values are, because again, you can't just say a good value and, and not be living it because that wouldn't be, you actually mean it either. Um, but she says something to operationalize your value as you, List a value, and then you say, what are three behaviors that do support your value? Um, what are the three slippery behaviors outside this value? What's an example when you are fully living this out? Meaning, hey, if you can't answer these questions, um, it may not be one of your core values. That's right, right. Oh. So she also gets into... I'll, much of the rest of the chapter is on feedback, which again, mm -hmm. we talked about in our last book study, the other half mm -hmm. of the church, but she gets into some very practicals as it relates to both giving feedback and receiving feedback. Yeah, and, and the connection is your feedback to me and my feedback to you will help remind me if I'm living by my values or not. Right. I mean, she talks about compassion and empathy. Does she say self-compassion? Um, yes, but but it's yeah, I, I like how on one of these pages she says, I, I, I have these three statements I tell myself when I'm getting feedback. One is I'm brave enough to listen. Another, there's something valuable here. This is the path to mastery, meaning this this will sharpen me um, because she has a great quote. Um, that I think has a good summary of, of why values. And it says, know my values equals know me, the, the K-N-O-W. Uh, because no values in O equals know me. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a play on words, but, but fascinating um, to really talk about values, how we're actually living them out, even... Um, whether we are using the words that, that align with the values we're living out or not, um, because that's really what we pass on. Yeah. And then just to wrap this up in recovery, we would, one of the ways we would give feedback is in the context of a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It could mm -hmm. be with a sponsor. It could be with an accountability yeah. partner. It yeah. could be with a friend. Um, it could be with a spouse, but we have mm -hmm. to find some safe, of course, trusted person to gain this valuable feedback from. Mm -hmm. Read the chapter. Read it. Yeah, it's an excellent and practical work. And it can feel hard, um, which is why I think, you know, it's important to help um, get other people involved with it, too. Because doing it by yourself, man, there's just uh, it can feel like you're going through a jungle and, and there's not a path in front of you, you know. Um, but we have two more uh, parts to get through. 
And we look forward to sharing those with you next week. All right. We will see you later. All right. Bye.